Hey, folks, today's episode is sponsored by Proper Cloth. Ordering a custom fit shirt has never been easier thanks to Proper Cloth. At propercloth.com, you can easily create a custom shirt size in seconds by just answering 10 easy questions. There are more than 500 fabric styles to choose from in business and casual styles. Your custom sizes and preferences are all saved on your profile, and you can even order on your phone. GQ calls them their favorite online custom shirt maker. Stop wearing shirts that don't fit. Start looking your best. Go to propercloth.com slash WTF and enter gift code WTF to save $20 on your first shirt. Yes. Yes, do that. All right, let's, let's do the show. Let's start the show. Let's make the show happen. All right, let's do this. How are you, what the fuckers? What the fuck, buddies? What the fucking ears? What the fuck, Nicks? What's happening? I'm Mark Marin. This is my podcast, WTF. Welcome. Welcome to it. How how are you holding up? My heart goes out to people who lost people in uh, the UK in that horrible uh, event. And I, uh, you know, and, and just everything else. Everything else. Today on the show, I have a conversation I had last week with uh, Reza Aslan, the uh, the writer, theologian. Is that what you call it? He's a uh, specializes in religions. Perhaps you know him. Uh, he's a frequent uh, guest on uh, news shows and uh, other shows. He's written some some great books. He's now the host and executive producer of the show Believer. On CNN, it airs Sunday at 10 p.m. He also, he was also a consulting producer on the HBO show The Leftovers, and you can pick up some of his, uh, his books like No God But God and Zealot, The Life and Times of Jesus of Nazareth, wherever you get books. Interesting talk. So I had Paul Rust here the other day, and, uh, he had brought up a thing that he did with me years ago. Now, I operate in, you know, especially when I was doing radio, I was, you know, in such a, um, I was in such a state of sort of exhaustion and, and, uh, panic and just, uh, some version of post traumatic stress disorder that I, I, my memory is sort of shot from those times. But, but I talked to uh, Brendan McDonald, my producer, and, um, and we, he, and he went out, he went and found this radio bit. See, now, back in the day when we were doing, when I had moved to L.A. after the Air America time and I was doing a nightly show out of KTLK, we had a working relationship with the UCB Theater to do comedy sketches with their students and performers. I didn't know a lot of them, but, you know, we'd get re- referred them and they'd pitch stuff. So we found the bit. This was in March 2006, the first week that the Mark Marin show was on the air here in Los Angeles uh, on KTLK, as I said. The bit happened over the course of a of our it was a two hour show, and it was Paul calling in four different times with the idea being that we had a, a real time movie reviewer, someone who would tell us how a movie was going as it was happening. That was the uh, that was the riff, that was the angle. So uh, so here it is. This is Paul Russ back in two thousand and six with me uh, on the the Mark Marin show. There's all four parts together. Listen, folks, it's Friday, it's a big movie night, and it's also just a couple of days away from the Oscars, so we thought we'd try something uh, pretty revolutionary here uh, to help satisfy the public's need for accurate, up-to-the-minute film criticism. Live on the phone, friends, from the Arclight Theater is our real-time movie reviewer, Paul Rust, who's going to conduct the world's first film review during the course of the movie. Paul, are you there? Yes, yes, I'm here. I'm so, right here in okay. the theater. Okay, what's going on? Uh, right now, uh, the previews actually have just started, and uh, there's a moment of anticipation in the air for, for the yeah. movie, Mark. Sure, Please sure. Answer. Sure, y'all, uh, y'all set up there at the theater? Yeah, yeah, there's a preview right now for yeah. uh, Failure to Launch, uh-huh. the Matthew McConaughey vehicle, uh-huh. and uh looks pretty good. Looks okay. Pretty good. All right, Paul, so, wait, so why, why don't we let you get settled in, and we'll get okay. back to you in a few minutes when uh, you can give us a review of the first act. What are, you going, what, are, what are we going to be seeing? Do you have any idea? going to be seeing the Oscar nominated Good Night and Good Luck. All right, all right. Well, I appreciate you doing this, Paul. It's a, it's a, it's a revolutionary thing and no one's ever done it before. So yeah, we're, we're, break, we're breaking new 
ground tonight, Mark. You, you're telling me, man. So I'm, I'm looking forward to the uh, As It Happens review. Uh, we'll get back to you, so, so hang tight and enjoy the movie. Okay, thank you. Thank okay, you. And, and try to be quiet. Yes, yes. Okay, Sorry. good, good, good. All right, so we'll check back in with Paul. That's going to be interesting. It's never been done before. All right, so folks, as you know, if you've been listening, we've got live on the phone right now from the Arclight Theater is our real-time movie reviewer, Paul Rust, who is going to be reviewing, uh, what's it called again? The uh, Good Night and Good Luck, the movie about Edward R. Murrow as it unfolds. Paul, uh, what's, what's happening in the, in the film, Paul? Uh, well, so far, in uh, Good Night and Good Luck, Edward R. Murrow has actually been forced to go undercover at this as an obese African-American woman. <laughs> it's very funny. Wait, 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 Paul, Paul. Paul, Paul, what, Paul. What, what, it what? sounds like you're in the wrong theater, Paul. I think you're watching Big Mama's House 2. Is that possible? Ah, um, actually, yeah, now it makes sense why Edward R. Murrow kept saying, damn, girl. Uh, now that's all right, all right, all right Paul. Now. All right, it's all Paul. Clear. Paul, put, put, just get yourself into the right theater, and we'll call you back in a little while. Okay? Sounds good. Thank okay. You, Mark. All right, buddy. All right. Wow, that that should. Be. <laughs> he was in the wrong theater. And how long does it take to really realize that? Do you know what I mean? I mean, he's sitting there, and I, maybe he doesn't know where Edward R. Murrow is. Right now, we got a guy at the movies. We got our, our guy Paul Rust, who is a real time movie reviewer. We are breaking new ground on radio. He's at uh, uh, Good Night and Good Luck, and let's let's check in with him. Uh, Paul, what's happening in the film, my friend? Uh, well, right now, uh, Edward R. Murrow. He, um, well, he, he uh, his uncle. Uh, yep, that's right. His his uncle. He um, he died, what you... and uh, and now Murrow has to spend the night in a haunted house to inherit it. Oh, yes. what, what, what the hell are you talking about? I mean, I saw the movie. I don't remember that. I don't, I don't understand what you're talking no, about. No, I said a large sprite. Okay? Wait a minute, Paul. Wait, I said a large sprite. Paul. Can you what? what? You're at the concession stand. Come on, man. You're supposed to be the movie guy. Okay, uh, Mark. The, what? Uh, the movie's pretty boring. Okay, and I just wanted some sour patch kids. Well, what you, so how long are you spending out there? You, I mean, you're just making stuff up now? I mean, can you just get your food and go back in the movie and try and let's try and pull this together and, and, and get a, a good close on this thing? Because we want to do this again, Paul. It's very boring. Yes, I can, I can give it a shot. Just go, just go, just go finish the film and, and, and we'll call you in a few, like, I guess we'll get back to you in about 15 minutes to find out how it ends and, and see if we can close this up with a little, little juice, all right? Can I bring the Sour Patch Kids? I don't know what movie theater. Yeah, you, yeah, you can. You're allowed to eat in the theater. Come okay, on. Thank you. Thank okay, you. buddy. I'll thank talk to you in a minute. Man, I thought that was going to work out so much better. He can't even watch the whole damn movie. Uh, let's check back in with our buddy Paul Rust, who's uh, down there at the uh, at the ArcLight. Uh, he's uh, doing an in theater review of Good Night and Good Luck. Paul, what? Paul, Paul, what's happening, Paul? Mark. Mark, I know I should be quiet, but this movie is too exciting, okay? Oh, it says Edward R. Morrow has yeah. just been demoted, okay? <laughs> yeah. and him and Fred Friendly are not happy about this. Uh-huh. Like they are quite disenchanted. Yeah. 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 What? Shut up. What? Shut up. You're ruining the movie. Okay. <laughs> hey, this is a free country, buddy, okay? Don't try to censor <laughs> me. All right. Censor me, you McCarthyite. All right. I'm, a, I'm a Morrow. I'm a Morrow here, baby. All right. <laughs> All right, Paul. Paul, maybe yeah. I maybe I get out of theater there before you get hurt. How would that yeah, be? Yeah, maybe, maybe. So, uh, so the movie really picked up, and I'm glad you got excited. It sounds very compelling. I think you made it really interesting for everybody. Yeah, Mark. I'm not one for hyperbole, but this movie is blowing my mind. All right, man. Well, thank you uh, for doing the first Mark Marin show real time movie review, Paul. We'll try it again later. Thank you. Okay, buddy. Take care. You too. <laughs> So there you go. That was a little blast from the past. Me uh, improvising with Paul Rust on a phoner sketch. Uh, That music, by the way, if you're wondering, uh, we used there was by the Tomorrow Men. If you listen to my interview with graphic novelist Daniel Klaus last year, you might remember he talked about a movie version of Wilson uh, that was in the works. Well, now you finally get a chance to see it. It's Daniel Klaus, so if you love Ghost World, this is for you. And Woody Harrelson is playing Wilson, which is about as good as it gets when you need someone to play an original, larger-than-life character. From the director of The Skeleton Twins, Wilson follows a lonely and hilariously honest, middle-aged misanthrope 
who reunites with his estranged wife, played by Laura Dern, also amazing. Uh, he gets a shot at happiness when he learns he has a teenage daughter he's never met. In his uniquely outrageous and slightly twisted way, Wilson sets out to connect with her. Judy Greer and Cheryl Hines co-star. It's a great cast. Make sure to check out Wilson, only in theaters starting Friday, March 24th. So now, I've got uh, Reza Aswan coming up, and... Uh, he, it's another interesting thing. Back when I was doing morning radio, he would also call in, and, and I, I I remind him of that. He he was sort of the go to guy for uh, uh, Muslim related news uh, on some level. I never met him face to face, and it was uh, exciting to talk to him in person because it was a talk about faith, about religion, about his new show, which I watched a few episodes of, and I liked. And I'm somebody that doesn't have a uh, a real uh, religion in place. I don't have a God in place. I, I go in and out of faith. I, I do tend to um, find a lot of, uh, you know, reprieve in uh, doing this and doing stand up and playing guitar and being creative and trying to, you know, have conversations with people and connect with people. But, but faith is interesting. And, you know, it was a, is a very sort of um, deep and personal conversation that we had about a lot of stuff, you know, ranging from, intellectual things to things uh, in his life growing up uh, Muslim here in America uh, from uh, Iranian uh, parents who left Iran. And uh, it was a conversation I, I've never had before. So you know, we're going to talk to him in a minute. But what happens when a med school graduate with $500,000 in student loan debt can't find a job and starts conducting free therapy sessions for patients he finds on Craigslist? There's only one way to find out. Watch the new series Shrink featuring Tim Baltz and other top Chicago comedians only on CISO. With CISO, you get unlimited access to CISO original series, next day late night, hilarious stand-up specials, and binge-worthy classics, including 42 seasons of Saturday Night Live, the entire Monty Python catalog, the IT crowd, and much more. Plus, CISO has tons of other great original series in addition to Shrink, like My Brother, My Brother and Me, as well as the animated fantasy role-playing game Harmon Quest, and the fake reality show Bajillion Dollar Properties, created by the sick geniuses behind Comedy Bang Bang and Reno 911. And it's all hand-picked, ad-free, and on-demand. All for just three ninety nine per month. No joke, people. Just go to CISO, S-E-E-S-O dot com, right now to sign up for one month free with promo code WTF at checkout. That's CISO dot com, spelled S-E-E-S-O dot com, promo code WTF. Go get yourself some funny, folks. Sometimes these conversations I've been having lately have just been great. I really enjoyed the uh, uh, Louis Theroux. Uh, I, I've enjoyed, uh, I, talk, I like talking to Paul Rust. And, and, you know, sometimes these conversations, like the same with Louis, that me and Reza, it becomes a, a, a real sort of a intellectual but emotional conversation about things that are, you know, really significant to uh, most people. And, you know, when I get engaged in one of these conversations, I, it's, it's very exciting for me, not, not in a way that, well, I'm not necessarily learning about another person, but you're sort of, you know, kicking around ideas that, that, that pressure you to engage in what those ideas really mean. And, and in this conversation, it was faith and religion, belief, and, and also talking to somebody with, with a profoundly different life experience for me and a, and a life experience that I think is relevant in the world we live in now where everything is polarized and really being broken down into very black and white type of arguments, which is just never, never the case with human beings. So let's go now to me and uh, Reza Aslan. Uh, he's now the uh, producer uh, and host of Believer on CNN and airs Sundays at 10 p.m. And as I said, uh, you can pick up his books uh, like No God But God and uh, the controversial uh, zealot, The Life and Times of Jesus of Nazareth. Smart guy. And my neighbor. This is me and uh, Reza Aslan. You know, we used to um, talk to you a lot. I've talked to you before. I think we have. No, I know I have. I used to be the morning show guy on Air America, and we used to call you a lot. That's right. I mean, that's we, right. I mean, on Morning Sedition, we talked that's to you right. 
fairly frequently. Man, that's like 10 years ago or something. More. Right? Yeah. It's like 13 years 13 ago. 13 years ago. Right. You were one of the uh, the go-to uh, uh, jihadi guys. <laughs> yeah, right. Like, we need some information on uh, this Al-Qaeda business. All things, Let's all get things, Reza yeah, on the line. Islam, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so you've been th- doing this beat for a while, that yeah. beat, the... the uh, not a pundit, but you're you're a scholar of religion, and and you uh, you covered uh, the Muslim beat. Yeah. So you were like a guy <laughs> that people you know knew, but so you've been getting death threats since then. Yeah, I mean, look, uh, I pretty much since I've been in the public eye, I've been getting death threats from whom? Um, I imagine from Muslims as well as uh, yeah, it, it, it runs the gambit, so it depends. Like. Uh, you know, when I when I first started and I wrote that my first book about Islam, which is No God But God, um, I got a lot of death threats from kind of extremist Muslim groups who thought that I was, you know, heretical in the way that I was describing Islam. But I also got like a lot of death threats from uh, extremist Jewish and Christian groups, you know, who were basically, uh, oh, you're just an you're just an Islamic apologist. You know, but the uh, angle of that book was was really seeking some sort of uh, moderate dialogue. Well, it was just basically like a a uh, a popular introduction to Islam in all of its diversity. But right. it was it was clearly critical right. of some of the more sort of fundamentalist readings. Yeah. You know, and it was yeah. an attempt to bring some kind of you know understanding and and yeah. uh, right. some sense of you know moderate. Uh, voice to it. Well, I think that, like in these in, in these areas, and also with the new CNN show, like your your empathy and you know willingness and your diplomatic disposition, uh, it, it it you know it leaves you vulnerable. It does, and I'll, and like, listen, I know it's religion, right? People tend to take that kind of seriously, right? <laughs> you Do know? you? Uh, I mean, I take religion. Seriously, in the sense that, you know, I value people's beliefs. I value faith. I recognize the good and the bad that religion has had on society, you know, throughout history. I understand that it is deeply a part of the human experience, that like literally it is a part of our evolution as Homo sapiens. You know, we can trace it all the way back to the beginning. Yeah, yeah, to the first uh, little etchings. Yeah, but I also recognize that, um, it's a man-made thing right and i mean man-made like literally man-made like people with penises yeah um and and as a result like any man-made thing it's flawed like you're supposed to be able to pick out its critical parts now praise it for what it's good and pra- you know and, i i, and I imagine bad now you know in retrospect now that you have a a large menu of religions to pick from <laughs> that have you know you know some have succeeded some have failed some have mutated uh, some like uh, you, you talk a little bit in the show about ha- have have gone many different directions within their yep. religion, but I, I think uh, initially uh, the idea, if you go back to the primitive beings, that you know th- there weren't too many critics, <laughs> I, I you know because they still had to explain why it was raining, <laughs> right? That's why right. didn't the crops grow? You know, no one's gonna, <laughs> yeah. you take it out with take it up with God, yeah. But you know, don't don't you know don't shit on the shaman because <laughs> right, that'll exactly. only get you in trouble. That's true. I would I would love to kind of go back there and see like you know the shaman debates. You know, it's like I, I don't know if there were ones. I think that the yeah. shaman was one of the original spin masters. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, yeah, it's, it's funny that you bring that up because what's really fascinating is that religion doesn't become an institution until like really the time of the Mesopotamians. So let's say if we're being generous, like six or seven thousand BC. Yeah, but religious expression confidently yeah. can be traced to about 120 150,000 years ago right. and i think with a little less confidence but i think still with some measure of you know confidence can be traced even further maybe 200 300 even 400,000 years ago well i you know i'm sort of fascinated not so much re- with religion per se but with the need to believe like you yeah. know, one of the most important books, and, and I've talked about it a lot on this show, is uh, 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 the Denial of Death, Ernest Becker's mm-hmm, book. Mm-hmm. You know, which really blew my mind in that what he posits is is that the need to believe, to feel part of something bigger than yourself on some level, to define your life and fight the existential terror of knowing our own mortality, uh, is almost genetic. It is genetic. 
And in fact, when I talk about material evidence for religion, I'm yeah. talking about burial grounds. Uh-huh. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah. I mean, like, what every, there's a lot of, there's a lot of debate about how far back you can go and, and whether, like, some of the, you know, we found idols that are 300, 400,000 years old. And is that expression of religion or is it just some dude who was, like, carving what, the, like the Willendorf a Venus? Out of a rock. Exactly. Yeah. Mm. Um, and so uh, the Barakat Ram Venus, uh-huh. uh, among the, all the different Venuses, the Barakat Ram Venus, which is, is probably the oldest. It's like this little lump of rock that somebody, uh, a Neanderthal, somebody um, put uh, carved into the shape of a kind of a fat, naked yeah. woman. And so some scholars would be like, wow, that's the first expression, you know, the earliest expression of religiosity. And others are like, no, that's just like Neanderthal porn. Right. You know? Like, <laughs> yeah. So he, he was going knows? on a long walk. Yeah, yeah exactly. He's going to be out for a few days. He, <laughs> he needed, needed to take that with yeah, him. Yeah, his little, uh, his little uh, masturbation totem. <laughs> that, uh, literally, that's what people have said. And so technically we don't know and either answer is good, really. But, but, but yeah. if we're talking about absolutely unanimously defined religious expression yeah. we're talking about burial grounds and we can go back about 120,000 years that is that, that is uh, this the sanctity of uh, the dead in terms of it having implications that there was a ritual around it so there was uh, perhaps a belief of something that happens after it's actually a pretty simple formula right i mean there is no reason to bury a dead person. Well, there, you don't want it just hanging around. No, you do. You absolutely do. You just dump a dead person outside and some beast comes and takes it away. It's as yeah. simple as that. It's yeah, but then you got to see your brother, parts of him down the street, you know, like, <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. like I know cats, they don't need everything. <laughs> and you're going to come upon something. It's kind of jarring. But, but <laughs> I will say that like the idea of putting together the effort and this yeah. is what they would do. This is a fairly standard, you know, practice. They would dig a hole. They would usually fill the hole with flowers or like bits of metals, tools, yeah. things that the, that the living person had or, or cherished. Right. They would put the living person in there. They would often cover him in this like red ochre. Yeah. Um, they would put the living person in there, usually in some sort of pose, you know, uh-huh. uh, uh, facing the sun yeah. often. Uh, then they would bury it. They would put a rock there. They would come and visit it. Yeah. They would light fires around it. Occasionally, they would then uh, disinter the body, cut yeah. off the head, mm-hmm. uh, and then, you know, put some plaster and some seashells on it and then, you know, put the head up. The point is, is that all of that indicates that yeah. at the very least... These ancient peoples thought that this wasn't it. Right. So this argument that it all began because of death is not a bad argument. Right. Well, yeah, the terror, the fear, the, you know, the, the need to Control. know that. The, yeah, I mean, I can see that. But I, I also feel that, you know, maybe since day one, you know, life was oh, the one thing you knew about life. It was fairly miserable. So how do you, you know, uh, infuse hope, you know, into people? How does a leader infuse hope? You know, like, well, this isn't it. You know, I, I know it sucks here, but you, know, but this isn't it, <laughs> right? Right. I guess that's control. It, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a little bit of it's control. It's um, it's trying to maintain some sense of control over the nature and the and the way that the universe functions. Yeah. That has a lot to do with it. But there's a, I think there's something more fundamental because, um. If religion is part of human evolution, and it is, there's no question about that, then it has to adhere to the laws of evolution. In other words, there has to be an adaptive advantage for it yeah. to have arisen and for it to have continued. The problem is, is that... that but that can be interpreted that's so broad. I mean, broad. you know, how, how anybody sees evolution in religious terms could either be horrendously fascistic or... Or the opposite. Well, but it doesn't. But that's the important thing. It doesn't become fascistic until much, much later. No, I get it. But but I could see, you know, even on a tribal level that, you know, if you have a, a couple of different gods that, you know, that that's fighting words. Yes. But this is even before there are gods. Oh. This is what I'm saying is that yeah. we're talking about the core, the origin of the religious impulse before it actually expresses itself in rituals, yeah, but, before it expresses itself in like <laughs> identifying a god. So what is that impulse? Like, oh, this is it? What we- you, that's it. That's exactly it. The impulse is, is this it? Yeah. That's, that's the impulse. Right. So how does that 
If that really is the impulse, yeah. the question that I think scientists and historians and anthropologists and everybody right. what what can't be answered is why? Yeah. Why? How does that how does that actually help you adapt? And there's a bunch of answers to well, this, well, right? I mean, right. Yeah. I mean, it seems pretty clear to me that like a uh, tell me your tell me your idea and I will shoot it down. <laughs> oh, no. I mean, it, it, like well, belief is a powerful thing that you know, if you have like-minded people that that believe, you know, a common idea, uh, there's no end to what can be done. And also there's no end to how it can, you know, build uh, family, build community, build things. Right. Uh, you know, pursue uh, common interests, uh, you know, protection. I mean, you know, what, it's, it's, a, it's a way of, of grounding a community. So that's the oldest argument for why religion exists. It, it goes bad? all the way to Durkheim. It makes perfect sense because mm. you think to yourself, well, sure. I mean, religion is about communal building. And if you are in a community that is bound together by like shared ideas yeah. and shared symbols, right. naturally it's going to give you an adaptive advantage you to you your community that? that doesn't. Here's the problem. Uh -huh. Number one, religion is by definition not inherently a communal thing it in fact it's as much uh inclu it's as much exclusive as it is inclusive it's as much about people who don't belong as it is about people who do belong so for example that, well so for instance if you are going to say we bind ourselves together according to this symbol yeah. whatever the symbol right. symbol means so this is even before belief right, right right so what you have to say is that there are those among us who accept those symbols and those who don't. Right. And so far from actually creating a necessarily cohesive group, uh -huh. it can do just as much in separating a group together, creating divisions within a group as inclusion within a group. Yeah, but there's group. still a couple of groups left. I would imagine that the people that are necessarily singled out, if they're individuals, are either ostracized or made shamans. <laughs> well, so the issue the issue here is, of course, does it have a uniquely adaptive advantage? Uh -huh. So it doesn't, not just for that reason, but also because the truth of the matter is that while religion, can, you can make an argument that religion is cohesive, it is not uniquely cohesive. In fact, kinship is the single most cohesive element in, in ancient social groups. Family. So in other words, yeah, a cave... Uh, you know the the people in yeah, your cave right. were not there because they all shared a similar belief system. Yeah. They were there because they were related in some blood. Yeah, but, blood then, way. but then he started having parties. You know, <laughs> neighbors come over. But it, here's here's the problem again: yeah. is that it sounds like it makes perfect sense, and certainly once you get to institutionalized religion, which yeah. is a hundred thousand years later, right. you can make an argument for that. That's but a long if you're time. talking about but if you're talking about why did it arise among people in caves? That that falls flat. So another argument is, but, oh, but, but but what we're talking about then, though, you know, to to get more heady, and then we'll get back down to earth, is that you know you're not talking about religion in the same with the same qualities. You know, you're talking about belief, yeah, yeah. You're but about, you're also yeah. talking about, Impulse, yeah. But 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 also like what you're considering religion. The reason they didn't hold up was at some point they realized you know, either there were too many gods or that animal didn't do what it was supposed to do or that isn't bad luck or whatever the 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 symbols or belief systems are it wore out right well it's a long time before we get well, to that I, I know that's what yeah. i'm saying yeah. so like to even call them you know religions is difficult that's true and because I, they and didn't I, survive and by the way that's why i'm not saying religion i'm saying the religious impulse okay. like the human impulse toward uh, religious belief. Okay. How did that arise and, and you in human evolution? Well, you don't, they, it didn't seem to me in the show that that, that was really, uh, uh, a theme. No. I mean, that, look, believer is about me immersing myself in the lived experience of these different religious groups who are on the margins so, or on right. the fringes who are misunderstood it's or a little misrepresented. uncomfortable a little uncomfortable in places it's very uncomfortable in places let, let yeah me, let me talk to you I, like you know what was where did you come from i was born in iran like in what year like you're younger than me. 72 so it was you know it was getting shitty there yeah, I mean, I, I lived through essentially a religious revolution. The, first, that, the Khomeini regime. Yeah, yeah. And you were how old? My country. I was seven years old. And you remember that happening? Oh, I remember it very clearly. Yeah, I mean, we fled for our lives afterwards. What now? What 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 position was your father in that required fleeing? Well, my dad wasn't. I mean, you know, he he was he had communist tendencies. He was a rabid atheist. Um, An intellectual. What did he do? 
he did nothing basically. He came from a fairly wealthy family, uh-huh. um, you know, big landowning family, mm-hmm. you know, lots of like a huge legacy. So they, those are usually, you know, once uh, you those know, once, are the guys to go. Yeah, they once they get grounded, <laughs> yeah. those are the guys that you know we need that land. We need that land. We need and, your home. Uh, we need all your heritage. Exactly. And I think and he felt that coming. He felt it coming very early on. In fact, I think his idea, because he was always so anti-religious yeah. anyway. Uh, you know, my dad was the kind of guy who, like, you know, always had a, a pocket full of Prophet Muhammad jokes that he would pull out right. in inappropriate times. Right. You know, Get him at killed parties. Now. Yeah, and yeah. he he looked around and he thought, oh no no no, like no um, more jokes. Yeah, I gotta get I get the hell out of this. And um, I think he thought that it would just be a, a temporary thing. You know, I mean, we basically left everything behind and came to the states with nothing. And then, really, and then next thing you know, um, you know, Khomeini took complete control and and Iran become became uh, essentially an Islamic theocracy. So what happened to the land? What happened to the money? What happened it's to gone. It? It's gone. It's gone. The that land is it. gone, the money is gone. Yeah. Uh you know, all those major estates were all broken up and then they were given to, you know, either religious foundations or these corrupt, you know, mullahs. So before I, I don't uh, forgive me for my my lack of uh knowledge about Iranian politics, but you know, Khomeini followed the Shah, right? Yeah. That was the, that was it. That yeah. was the, what they were fighting against. I and, mean, we went we went from an oppressive secular dictatorship to yeah. an oppressive religious dictatorship. Right. right. And <laughs> and for people like your dad, the secular dictatorship was a little more comfortable. Well, it was more beneficial to him. Sure. Right. I mean, yeah. it was it was uh, it, you know look the revolution. Part of why it succeeded so well is because that it was in the name of the lower classes and the in the you know. The, the poor and the people who who yeah didn't, I'm feeling a little of that have. yeah exactly right it kind of feels <laughs> yeah. kind of no, familiar I, I, I think we're all uh, feeling a little of that <laughs> which by the way is an argument that I make all the time that I think Americans in their overconfidence just simply you know dismiss like I grew up in a country that was one thing one day and something entirely different the next I understand how easy that transformation takes place yeah and also a lot of people grow up in authoritarian country yeah. Most and, people on the planet. T- t- it, most of the world, exactly, is authoritarian. And now I think a lot of Americans, you know, even those on the left who are rabidly against Trump and this, you know, fascist administration, even they have this confidence in the fact that, hey, we've been a democracy for like 240 years, man. That means it's permanent. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. like, no, that, no, man. It's, barely, no. it's, it's an if, infancy. I mean, one 9-11 style attack under this administration and we are fucked with the, I mean we are it's over great <laughs> it's over this is an administration that will you know go to its grave lying about the most useless shit possible how many people showed up at his at yeah. its inauguration what kind of lies do you think this administration will put forth it, you know when we are under some kind of existential attack in yeah. this in this country um this is an administration that citing no evidence whatsoever wants to ban Muslims from the United States. Imagine if there's a terror attack. Right. You know, this is an administration that has repeatedly said yeah. not only are they going to keep Guantanamo Bay open, but they want to start sending American citizens to fill it. Fill it up. Yeah, fill it up. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, and what's funny is that they keep saying stuff like this, and we all just keep saying, well, that's a horrible thing to say, but, you know, right. we're not, not going to take it seriously. But take this man seriously. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, okay. So when you guys flee, I'm taking it seriously. Yeah, I, mean, I, was, I was trying to have a good day. It's, getting, it's harder and harder. <laughs> but uh, but when you guys flee, where do you go? We actually first ended up in Oklahoma. Really? Um, yeah, my dad. My dad had like some time in college done yeah. like a, a study abroad semester in uh in uh like in Enid, Oklahoma or really? something like that. That's a that's pretty low budget study abroad there. <laughs> yeah, tell me about it. And then I think when when it was time to like flee and come to America, he just was like, well, I that's th- all I he think knew. He, I think he just assumed Oklahoma was America. Yeah, it is. Which by the way, yeah, he was absolutely absolutely right. Yeah, it's, so it's very America. We were in America, we were in Oklahoma for a little while. It didn't take that long for us to realize that there's more to America. Right, right. Not a, yeah. not, this can't be it. <laughs> this can't that be it. That was your religious moment yes. <laughs> so, about America. That's right. <laughs> Is this it? So, uh, we got it's in the weird. Coast. You don't hear a lot about Oklahoma. We got on the car and just headed west. And we ended up in the Bay Area. And that seemed more like it. 
Well, yeah, like, oh, yeah. Well, definitely is, a diverse you yeah. know, culture. So ba- what part of the Bay Area? San Jose. Well, San Jose, of course, was full of uh, Mexican immigrants. This yeah. is before, you know, the big, uh, you know, Silicon Valley sure. boom when it yeah. was just like mostly, you know, vineyards and things right. like that. And it was perfect for me because this is like 1980. It's during the Iran hostage crisis. You know, it's like a time in which everybody is, you know, I mean, so much anti-Iranian sentiment, so much anti-Muslim sentiment. I'm like seven years old trying to not be weird, surrounded by all these Mexican immigrants. So I was like, yeah, I'm Mexican. I was just like, yeah, yeah. What's up, Bato? Bato, I'm yeah. Mexican. I learned how to break dance. Yeah. You, um, could, you could pass a little. I could pass a little did bit. You, did you learn Spanish? Yeah. I mean, you have no choice. Like, you just, you're surrounded Right by Spanish speakers, so I just started speaking Spanish, and people would be like, "Where are you from?" And I'd be like, "I'm from Mexico, Orale." I would yeah. just end every sentence with Orale. Um, but did you actually become conversational in Spanish? No, I mean, hell no, no. Uh, you no, couldn't no. do it. But n- what's funny is n- neither could these kids because yeah. they were all born in America. In America, right. so we all had that same, you know, sense of uh, you know, like dispossession. Now, what was your what was the feeling in the house? How many brothers and sisters you got? Uh, I had one sister who, who was born in, in uh, Iran and came with us, and then one sister who was born in America. Now, so, like, what what is the, is the household during the 80s? Is your father watching TV and thankfully got out or mad or concerned about, you know, property? I mean, like, what was the tension in the house? What did he, where did he land, you know, in terms of occupation and things? I mean, my dad, who just recently passed, basically, like, died like with like a bitter you know like i think the last words on his mouth was like goddamn mullahs those yeah. goddamn mullahs yeah he, you know that's pretty standard for like that that uh, generation of iranians who came to the united states i mean it's like this profound like anti you know mullah hatred i mean these were the guys who like w- voted for george w bush these right. were the guys who voted for trump even i mean yeah. if my dad were alive right now he would be like, I don't know that Trump. He's got some good ideas, yeah, you know, like right. Muslim ban. I agree, you know, I, right. you know, those. I don't want any Muslims in America, <laughs> and especially like, you know, my wife's family. Like, this is great. Like, no more Iranians <laughs> coming to America. This is fantastic. Your mother, my mom's, yeah, my mom's, uh, my mom's uh, family. My was, dad was not, uh, was more uh, uh, religious, a little more religious than my dad's. Family. No kidding. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, that's a, that's an interesting dynamic. Right. Like, I mean, I had to I had to imagine that must have fueled some of your interest. Totally. And in fact, when we were in the States now for my dad, it was like, this is great. I don't have to pretend I'm a Muslim anymore like I did in Iran. And for my mom, like she still very much wanted us to, you know, maintain our, you know, our cultural a little heritage bit. So, but, in the house, in right. the house. But like, that, but we were that's... told very clearly when you leave this house, you do not tell anyone that you're Iranian or you're Muslim, like you just keep that shit to yourself. Well, that, well, that's interesting because that's not unlike any, you know, I don't know necessarily religious subculture that immigrated at any time mm-hmm. where, you know, it, it might have taken a generation to to integrate. Absolutely. Yeah, and and yeah. that it's interesting to me that you grew up, you know, which is something you don't hear because the dialogue is so, um, you know, charged that, you know, this idea that someone like your father, who is by birth a Muslim, but ultimately doesn't give a shit, uh, exists. Exactly. <laughs> Which, this is the funny thing, is I think that's, people need to realize that that's a sort of fundamental fact of the entire world. With think, religion. Yeah, you know, Americans have this such skewed idea about, you know, not just everybody else, uh, but Religion in particular. Yeah. You know, like I love hearing people like Mike Huckabee or, you know, Newt Gingrich, these like devout Christian nationalists yeah. who are like, we need to change the Constitution so that it is in alignment with the Bible. We have to, you know, outlaw um, sodomy because, you know, God said so. And then you're like, hey, how do you feel about the Muslim Brotherhood? And they're like, theocrats. Yeah. Those people want a, you yeah. know, religious yeah. state. And it's like, dude. What did you just right. hear what you just said? Right. You know? Well, that, but this is our guys. This is, yeah, this Those is our are the bad guys. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I meant, our, I meant my, my God, yeah, not yeah, their yeah, God. Yeah, yeah. Um, but when did you start realizing this? I mean, you know, like, you know, in your childhood, you have this, your know, father who, you, you know, what did he end up doing is for a job? So when he was, when he was like a rich kid in Iran, he went and got a degree in accounting because he figured, oh, I got to do something. Yeah. Um, and then when he came to America, he's like, oh, shit, I have to be an accountant now. <laughs> and so he spent, you know, almost 40 miserable years as an accountant. 
and uh, and like hated every minute of it. But he provided, and you guys grew Absolutely. up well. And, yeah, yeah, you yeah. know, I mean, you know, we we're pretty poor, but yeah, he, he was miserable. He provided. He hated his job. He hated every minute of his job. Was he? Uh, was he? Was he always running around yelling? <laughs> he, he was. He, he did yell a lot, but it's mostly like grumbling, like yeah. "God damn it!" Yeah, yeah. God damn mullahs! God damn uh, it! Uh, uh, accounting. Goddamn numbers. <laughs> so, so, but you're. But let me tell you something. This is the funny thing about him is that I don't know if you know Iranians, but Only a couple. there's there is a there is a very deeply embedded. Um, cultural tradition in Iran called Tarof. Uh-huh. And this is it's it's really hard for Americans to understand this. Yeah. Um it it the best way that I can define it is that it's like insincere deference. It's like a game of chicken that Iranians play with each other about who can lower himself the most, uh-huh. right? So, and it takes it takes many forms. So, for instance, you know, uh, about like picking up a check at a restaurant. Like, you know, everyone argues about picking up a check at a restaurant, but Iranians, like, it'll become a knife fight. Yeah. You know, I mean, I've seen my dad, you know, basically wrestle people to the ground. Over uh, wanting to over, pay the check? Over wanting to pay the check. Yeah. yeah. Um, if someone compliments you of something if i was like hey mark that's a nice watch your job is to say no it's this not. watch is yours oh it's right. yours you just take it off and you just hand it hand it over is that a humility thing what is that it's fake humility oh so the problem is is that everyone in iran because th- again this is it's like the foundation of what it means to be iranian yeah is this kind of fake deference thing yeah um Everyone in Iran knows this, and it's a game that we all play. We don't yeah. even take it all that seriously, right? You know, right. like I, I went to Iran once, and I and I was uh, negotiating over some trinket that I wanted to buy. Yeah, and like I'm negotiating for like ten minutes, and it's like you know, this fifty cents, no, forty cents, no, forty-seven cents, forty-two cents. Finally, we settle on it, and I'm like, okay, fine, forty-five cents. And then the guy says, oh, I can't take your money. No, I can't. I I can't. I can't do that. <laughs> now, while he's saying I can't take your money, he's yeah. filling out the receipt, right? You know, yeah. And while I'm saying no, I insist, I insist, I'm handing over the money. Yeah. It's just a game. Yeah. Here's the problem: Americans don't know how to how to play the game. Yeah. So what happens all the time, and every Iranian has a story like this, is that Iranians come to America, they instinctively play the tarof game. Yeah. And the American guy doesn't play along. So it's like, hey, that's a nice watch. Oh, this watch, it's yours. Oh, thanks, man. Yeah. <laughs> they yeah. take the watch. Yeah. So my dad. You know, he's an accountant. He starts getting clients, right? The clients come in. He does all the work for them. And they say, uh, you know, how much do I owe you? And my dad instinctively says, nothing. I can't. I can't take your money. And the client goes, holy shit. Thanks, man. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so so, he did, was so not, we, we would never get paid. He like, kept he, doing it? He kept doing it. See, that? I mean, I guess that's one of the arguments to, to integrate you know, <laughs> yeah, fully into quickly. the culture. <laughs> Integrate quickly. You know, he would occasionally accept gifts. Like, I'd come home and there'd be a vacuum cleaner and I'd be like, what's that? You know, like, but oh, my, my he client must have been gave the me most a vacuum. popular accountant oh, in oh, San Jose. Me? Yeah, especially in the immigrant community. You know, he with was other, like... Or with Mexicans or... Yeah, every, like Mexicans and Filipinos yeah. and, you know, everybody... No, no Iranians because they know they'd have to pay. Yeah, exactly. The Iranians, exactly. That. <laughs> they never worked with other Iranians. <laughs> So, like, when do you like? So, but you are brought up with with some Quran ed- education. Quran, no, no. But literally, we we came to America, and it was like we had divorced ourselves from. Like, it was like we stripped our house clean of any signs of Islam. Out of fear or desire? To- Out of fear. Well, from my dad's point. It was like, ha ha, freedom! Finally. Yeah, Finally. I don't have to keep pretending. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, from my mom's point, it was very much an issue of safety, uh-huh. right? Like she would sometimes pray, but like quietly and in the corner, you yeah. know, no one was looking. Um, so she held on to it. She holds on to it to this day. Right. It's been like 40 years. And I swear to God, to this day, yeah. like if I'm on CNN, yeah. you know, saying something about, you know, Trump, my mom will call me afterwards and be like, what are you doing? Keep your mouth shut. They're going to take you away. Yeah. And I'm like, mom, that's like not a thing. Not yet. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's the thing. I used to be able to say confidently, mom, yeah. this yeah. isn't Iran. Yeah, that's yeah. not what happens. Right. Nowadays, I'm not yeah. so sure, yeah, actually. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, I think right. she's got a point. But but I, I think it's interesting that you know what seems to temper your exploration of religion is this idea that you're you're not... I, I don't think I, I think uh, you're empathetic to the individuals involved, yet you understand the the potential, um, you know, danger. 
Yes. So, you know, and it, it seems to come pri- primarily from the balance of your childhood that, you know, there are two ways. Like, you, there is the birthright of religion, and you sort of passively say, yeah, I'm Muslim, yeah, I'm Jewish, I'm Catholic. And, you know, what you don't think, like, you know, Catholics uh, and, and a lot of Jews are sort of like, yeah, but I don't, you know, I don't go. I went, when I was a kid, I went. But for some reason, a lot of people don't think Muslims ever say that. I know, I know. And, 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 you know, obviously when I, just by talking to you now, of course, you know, with, when there's a billion, however many Muslims, yeah. they, they can't all be, you, you know. I mean, it's so logical, right? Like no, yeah, who the hell nobody in their right mind thinks that every, like all billion and a half Christians think the same right, way. Right. But, th- but that's a human thing. That is the human, that, that is the sort of weird. It's tribalism. It's tribalism, right? But there's this like the, this idea that y- y- you know you got a group of people, you know, human beings. You know, you, the percentages of the people that are going to be, you know, compulsively fanatical is you know, very small to the people that are like, all right, you know, we, exactly those guys are and getting, loud, yeah, right. But you but know? just it's just human nature to be like, I got a life. Well, yeah, am I going to pray nine times a day? I know, but it's so funny. It's so fascinating, too, because of that, that whole argument, because you hear all the time, like, how come we don't hear from moderate Muslims? It's like, because we're in the fucking grocery store. Like, mm. what do you, what do you want? You know, how come when, like, Robert Deere shot up at Planned Parenthood last year, I didn't hear a bunch of Christians, like, on TV being like, that's not really Christianity. Why? Because they were minding their own damn business. Yeah. You know? And it's the same, it's the same thing for people of all faiths. Yeah. And listen, I am I am constantly being assailed by extreme uh adherence to religions, you know, whether yeah. it's like radical Hindus who hate me because of believer or radical Muslims who hate me because of, you know, whatever. I get so many death threats from radical Christians. Actually, this is a absolutely absolute truth. The worst that I get it from, the worst sort of threats and anger and just by numbers and yeah. sheer sheer volume is from radical atheists that they're the ones that i'm like most often like jesus why I, I because like, you're too uh, sympathetic yeah that i even take religion seriously at all you know then uh, well, or i take belief seriously well, at what, all. but you know there is an element to the show that you, you know i think you're uh, approaching these um these subjects in earnest and in a vulnerable way that you know where where are you with belief what did you, so you 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 were passive as a muslim and you just remained that way your whole life no i mean look I, you said it perfectly before is that that personal experience uh-huh. of seeing the power that religion has to do being run out of your country yeah to do tremendous good and bad yeah you know i mean that's the important thing right i mean the same christianity that gave us a civil rights movement gave us trump yeah okay so i get it yeah um it it can be good or bad depending on how it's used how how the people are guided how the people are led right how the belief is exploited and expressed and expressed and and what level of desperation right is driving their intent that fascinated me even as a little kid because of the I, fanatic. Yeah, but I never had an opportunity to actually do anything about it because, again, like my household was like, no more religion in this house. Yeah. Um, when I was in high school, I um, had some friends who went to this evangelical youth group. Yeah. And I went with them mm-hmm. and I heard the gospel story and I was like, whoa, this is the cra- This is the most amazing thing I've ever heard in my entire life. Like, wait, hold on, hold on, hold on. The God of heaven and earth came down. Uh, in the form of a baby and then like grew up and died for our sins mm. and on all we got to do is believe in him and we go to heaven that's the greatest thing i've ever heard in my entire life and in also, high school in high school wow you were you were lost i was <laughs> <laughs> well but also the other thing too is that and you know i didn't recognize this at the time i understand it much more today but that was my like you know that was my america id card right yeah. like What Jesus is your entry card into America. Like, once you accept Jesus in your heart, your skin color doesn't matter anymore. Your ethnicity doesn't matter anymore. Like, the accent you speak with doesn't matter. So you're you're in high school and you go this thing and you're surrounded by a lot of different types of people. No, just white people. Just white people. But but they were sort of like, well, what do you, you want to... They were like, do you want to accept Jesus into your heart and be one of us? And I was like, hell yes, I do, I do. And you believed. Yeah, and I don't want to make it sound like it was cynical, because again, I mean, I was like no, I can 15, tell it, I didn't understand. No, but even now, you know, as a person who is vulnerable and as a person who, 
you know, is, you know, non-religious in any way, uh, you, you know, but still fraught with, you, you know, fear and a, a certain lack of, uh, you know, emotional and spiritual stability and somebody who intellectually understands how that is provided by these mm -hmm. systems. You know, I still resist it because I think as you get older, your capacity for suspending your disbelief <laughs> diminishes unless shit gets real bad. Yeah. So I, I guess, you know, my question is, what was it essentially in, in talking about that religious moment or that question, that primal question in that moment, you as that, that kid, you know, w outside of, you know, backloading becoming American, what was it in you that bought it? You know, even in these shows, I see that you're still vulnerable to it, yet you have a, a sort of uh, boundary, but you still allow yourself to immerse yourself and, and experience the feelings. But, you know, in the show, what, what became clear to me after watching four or five of them was that, all right, you, you're, you're, you're open to it and you're engaging in it and you're saying, yeah, that felt this way or this felt that way. But you're, uh, you know, you're not going to, you know, midway through the series go like, yeah, I'm going to just stay with the voodoo people. <laughs> right. The, the know, commitment. It's really, you're bringing up something so, so good right now. I've never actually <laughs> made this connection before. It's like, I feel like I should pay you for like therapy, but. <laughs> Yeah, there was there was that feeling of belonging, going back to the yeah. purpose of religion, right? With the there Christian was, thing. Yeah, there yeah. was that feeling. It's like, wow, I belong. Like, yeah. Nobody questions me anymore. Like, yeah. I am one of you now right. because, like, Jesus is your, like, welcome to America card. Right. But there was also, I think that experience was interesting because it taught me to value faith which i still do and I, hopefully in the show you get that you get that i value these people's faiths i'm yeah, not to there. a fault almost some people would say like i'm totally open to your faith i may think it's a little bit bizarre but you know i'm going to be open to it i'm going to i'm not going to come to you with with judgment okay? right right okay right at the same time though it wasn't long in my sort of christian and this was a i should say a very conservative evangelical christian group it wasn't long before they were like also, gays are going to hell. And also, the Bible says you can't have sex. And also, and I was like, wait, what? Yeah. And I'm the kind of guy, and I've always been this guy, where like, I'm not gonna, if you, I'm not gonna just take your word for it. So right. I would, you know, go home and I would open up the Bible and I'd be like, wait, 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 where does it say you're not supposed to have yeah. sex before marriage? Cause it literally, literally does not say that anywhere from Genesis to Revelation. Uh, wait, wait, where does it say that? Like, How could it have said that for to them to, to populate the world like they did? All those kids, they lived 900 <laughs> yeah, years exactly. and they had yeah. you know, 200 on, kids. Uh, you know, all this stuff that I was told that the Bible says, I would go in and I'd be like, wait, it doesn't, it doesn't say that. And then I would go back to church and I'd be like, excuse me. Um, now, yeah. the, the Iranians <laughs> yeah. here. The brown guy, the brown guy has a question <laughs> in the back. Uh, it doesn't actually say that. Yeah. And what I thought what would happen is a conversation. Right. Uh, and instead they would sort of lay hands on me and try to kind of remove the doubt. And I was like, this shit is not, this is not working for me. But the irony is at the same time, I valued the faith, but started becoming critical of religion. Right. And that, right. that has been essentially my, my, uh, you know, that's my calling card, you know, where I'm like, I understand religion is something made by human beings. I understand the flaws of it. I get the institutional aspects of it, the way that it can be, you know, towards good and to bad. Okay. But I also value that people have faith. Yeah, they, I know, but they believe faith, these things. It seems like you can separate that. You know, faith in and of itself uh, it doesn't require belief on some level. So, I, so I mean, there is a, a bit of a chasm there. They, I don't I, know. You I respect guess, faith. But I guess I actually I actually don't think of them all that separately. Like in other words, I don't think, for instance, you know, I get a, I get a lot of people. Um, you know, I have referred to um, atheism as a belief system, and mm -hmm. I get a lot of shit for that. Well, I I've, I've done that too. Yeah. That that there is a dogma to it. There is absolutely a dogma to. It. I mean, it's predicated upon certain like postulates and hypotheses about the nature of the universe, much of which is impossible to prove, and yet a great amount of it. You know, is sort of taken in this sort of gospel way. Well, I mean, it's, well, there, the, the, the arguments there are, are really about reason. And, and there, there is a, a, a I don't want to say a, 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 a cynicism to it, but there, there is a, a need to hold a line at, at reason. 
And I couldn't agree more. Right. But I think it's incorrect to say that religious belief is by definition irrational or unreasonable. Yes, a lot of it is, but it need not be. Yeah, but I mean, but religious belief, especially in the culture we live in now and seeing how, you know, uh, mutated and malignant it, it, it can become where, you, you know, there, there's something about the American way. And I think there's something about the, the, the way of people that, you know, the nature of hucksterism requires belief. So the nature of sales requires belief that to be sold on something is probably just as ancient as uh, the organized religions. So it becomes this weird thing that to criticize belief in and of itself is is to criticize, you know, oddly capitalism. Well, in, <laughs> you said it perfectly in that there isn't anything unique about religious belief that sets it apart from these other forms of belief that you're talking about. Other now, than, some people other would say... Than, uh, 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 a, a transcendent faith. Well, that, see, but that's the thing, is that people will say, oh, but religious belief, you know, carries with it a certain amount of absolutism. Right. And it's like, well, yes, yeah, so does patriotism and nationalism. Yeah. You know, I mean, right. You, America right or wrong, right? You know, le love it or leave it. Um, you know, that kind of devout belief in American exceptionalism is as often absurdly applied as the most evangelical versions or fundamentalist but, but, versions of religion. But the payoff is to be part of something that transcends your own life. That transcends your own identity. That's right. That, that gives you... But a also, like, you're sense. like, yeah. you know, yeah, I'm willing to die for this. So... Whether, be it patriotism? But, uh, or, or Jesus, whatever. Or Jesus? Sure. Or your race? Or yeah. ethnicity? Then no one's going to die for Toyota. You know, like, you know, <laughs> right. like I'm, I'm going to... I mean, they may pay lip service to it being the best car, but it's like, you know, I'll go to my grave. It, that doesn't. And the weird thing is, is like, I, you know, even talking just, you know, improvisationally about this is that, you know, when planned obsolescence, you, you know, became part of, of the capitalist model mm -hmm. that, you know, you get a sort of you, you, an exception to the faith, you, you know, capitalism, yeah. right. You know, you sort of like, of course it broke. <laughs> there, you know, you got to buy a new one. You know, there's no, it's very rare that you can find something like these are going to last a lifetime. That shit's yeah. over. No. So, so that, I think that probably tempers, you know, and, uh, you, you know, the, certainly the American faith. That, but by that, but by the argument that you're making, though, yeah. it shows exactly the vacuousness of this position that, oh, well, then if we just get rid of religion, then, you know, will will be more peaceful but, but and that, more but prosperous. That's, but the thing that, that, that doesn't that's make any a, sense. Well, it doesn't make any sense primarily because, you know, and I've noticed this more now, is that by and large, most people are not, you know, in the habit of critical thinking. Now, like, if you could create, you know, and I imagine this was some of the answer. This was some of the the answers that communism was trying to provide mm -hmm. on some level, is that you know this is about you know people. You know, so, you, you know, in order for what you're saying, the, the, this rational, almost cynical, you know, belief system to be you know, universal, you know, would require people accept that they're going to die, accept their lot in life, accept personal sort of responsibility for their lot in life and the, the, the ability to do something about it in a proactive way. That a lot of that stuff is did too many leaps for most people. It's like, why, what, we just want to be taken care of, which I also think is the appeal of authoritarianism. It's like, it may not be democratic, but at least this guy, you know, has some, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, the, he has the narrow minded ability to, is an answer. Yeah, an answer. Yeah. Right. What you said about communism is perfect. Like, how quickly did communism go from a philosophy to a rigid fundamentalist ideology that that was responsible for the deaths of tens of millions of people, right? Again, look at the look at the twentieth century. Right. By far, by far, the most bestial century in human existence. Uh -huh. The deaths of hundreds of millions of people in yeah. the name of religion. No in the name of nationalism, in the name of socialism, in the name of communism, in the name of Marxism and Maoism and Stalinism. And capitalism. Capitalism. These are not religious That's movements. usually disguised, though. <laughs> yeah. It's a, capitalism ways, is behind yeah. about four of, of them. Of course, yeah. <laughs> but these are, these are in many ways actually devoutly secularist mm -hmm. ideologies. The fact of the matter is that religion, like every ideology is dependent on the individual and the community. You can use it for good, you can use it for bad. The problem is, is that human beings, because we are tribal, because we are want towards violence, because we are all about in-groups and out-groups, who is us, who is not us, will use God 
to kill each other, we'll use I mean, the flag to kill each right, other. Right, but you, you forgot about desperate and, and vulnerable and terrified. Yeah, <laughs> terrified. Fear, absolutely. And, so when and, I say, when I say, look, I'm going to go around the world and I'm going to introduce you to these religions that may seem weird to you at first. I'm going to immerse myself in them and I'm going to show you that there are beliefs behind these religions that you actually agree with, sure. that you connect with. But I think also, like, you know, in, in defense of atheism and in defense of, you know, that dialogue, that, you know, there, there has to be, you know, these things are, are almost eternal checks and balances towards, you know, uh, you know, a, a globalized, you know, authoritarian existence. Mm. That, you know, that dialogue has to happen. You know, there's going to be pushback on both sides, but like, not unlike, you know, I used to do a joke, uh, about, uh, ultra orthodox Jews at the wall. You know, praying in Israel, like mm -hmm. around the clock. In my mind, it's like they have to be there for the rest of us. Or if they one day go like we're done, you know what happens to it? <laughs> right. Do you, you know what I mean? Like it's it's not a belief in them or anything else, but these extremes, you know, afford the moderation that there has to be something to push against. Yeah, but I think that that push is happening from within these religious communities. Sure, you know, and I think that's what that's what gets. Um, missed a lot that people just assume that the extremes and the moderates or the progressives are all essentially in the same camp and that's like saying that you know well we're all americans so we all have to support the president yeah fuck that no yeah, yeah. The, the president is destroying the country and he may say he's doing it because he is patriotic and he loves the flag. I'm patriotic. I love the flag. And yeah. for that reason, I'm going to do everything I can to get rid of this guy. Yeah. Well, no, I, absolutely. So when you talk like, okay, so you, you know, once you start pushing back at uh, evangelicals as a teenager, mm -hmm. you know, what is your journey? Because like part of the desire to, to study what you studied and then watching you on this show, you know, approach this thing, you know, with an open mind and an open heart to a certain degree is that you know I have to assume intellectually the 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 drive to study religions or religion in general uh is is some sort of quest for answers but also a a a quest to to, to for your own control yeah <laughs> well so pushing back against evangelical christianity made me really really good at religion so i went to college cuz i wanted to be a writer yeah and i was like you know well uh i'm going to take a religion class cuz it seems interesting and i realized i like it and i'm really good at this but the more i started studying the religions of the world the more it became impossible to take any one of these religions all that seriously anymore for the simple fact that what we're talking about is that I suddenly realized, you know, they're basically just different languages for the same exact statement. Um, right. And that, that's something you pull through the series. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so I wanted I wanted a language for myself. You know, it was Christianity wasn't going to do it anymore. The symbols and metaphors of it had just kind of failed for me. And I wanted something else. Why don't you go with the Baha'is? I love the Baha'is. Yeah. Absolutely love the Baha'is. Yeah. But... I was encouraged by some of my professors to be like, well, why don't you like go back to your the, the faith that you grew up in? And I was like, I don't know anything about it. I know nothing about Islam at all. And so they were like, here's some books. Read read about it. <laughs> these are professors. You know? Yeah, these are my professors. Yeah. Priests, actually. Yeah. I went to Je a Santa Clara University, a Jesuit college. So these are like priests who were like... Maybe Catholic priests. Go back to being a Muslim. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, the Jesuits are quite different than, yeah. you know... Right. The other no, no, Catholics, of course. Yeah, but, yeah. Yeah. but anyway... Um, and I started reading up and I started realizing that this was the language that I preferred. These were the metaphors that I preferred. Just and because of the personal history or that they fell into place? No, it was you? really like an intellectual thing. Uh -huh. It was like the way in which God and creator and the relationship between the creator and creation and, and humanity's place in the world, the way that it's described, the language and metaphors, the symbols used to talk about this thing, you know, called life, um, rang true to me in a way that, um, the language of, uh, Christianity that I had been sort of reared in up to that point didn't anymore. Yeah. And, and by the way, this is, goes back to how we started this conversation, because what I discovered very quickly yeah. is that there's a massive difference between religion and faith. Faith, it's mysterious, it's ineffable, 
it's individual, it's fundamentally a choice. It's right. as simple as that. Well, that there isn't good. any mystery to it. You either believe that there is something beyond the material world or you don't. Yeah. No one can prove or disprove it. You just choose to believe it. Yeah. If you choose to believe it, then you have to ask yourself, well, do you want to do something about it? Do you want to experience well, that? Well, see, thing? I think that that particular uh, valve in the human mind is really what atheists are 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 saying like you, you know what i mean like don't that choice is not a choice I, and i think the religious people would say the same thing that's my point you know if you are a, a prone to that that you know that that you know is a a fundamentally exploitable vulnerability it can and be. It can be, right. Yeah. So like well, so can materialism, no, hence no, communism. No, I get that. Yeah. I get that. But that's where you start to find the hierarchy. That's where, like, even in your first show, that that, that Hindu caste system that has existed yep. for centuries, you know, exists because the people that are the untouchables, you know, that is it becomes a birthright. So yep. that vulnerability of their, you know, their uh eternal lot mm-hmm. generationally it you know, doesn't it doesn't come up for question, right? Yes. Yeah, you know, maybe a few of them do, but you know, the rest of them are like, just shut up and put the log on the fire, right? Right. So, <laughs> right, right. so what 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 becomes really tricky about that, and the way the power structures of religions work and how they're used, is is essentially that vulnerability and and any individual's responsibility to you know what what that will what they are going to be used for. Yeah, the way in which faith can be manipulated by religion uh-huh. for often bad things. Sometimes uh-huh. good things, yeah. but often bad things. And co-opted by larger systems to like do Like the bidding. Republican Party. Sure. Exactly. Or or the social structure in India. Right. You know, many Hindus would be like, the caste system, that's not a religious thing. That's just some you know politically minded form of control. I, I didn't know about it until I watched created. your show. Really? Yeah. And some people would say that. And uh, some Hindus would say no. This is a deeply religious thing. It's it's part of who we are. Who's right? Neither. But inescapable Both. karma. What kind of fucking sentence is that to put on somebody? Yeah, exactly. That, you know, it's just like, well, you were born into this. You know, your people have been polluted forever, which is horrible, inescapable karma. And because of your job, you can't get out of it. You are here to burn the bodies. When Mark said that religion is the opiate of the people, he was right. What was, he was wrong about is so is communism, so is nationalism, so is socialism. Yeah. All of those things, all of those ideologies are means of controlling populations for the yeah. betterment of the, of the powerful and the wealthy. But does that, therefore, by definition, devalue or delegitimize faith? And I say no. Why would it? Because, again, if faith is all about which I really do believe that it is, a simple choice about how you think of yourself in the universe, whether you think that this is it, or whether you think that, the, no, there is something beyond this. Okay, well, well, I think that is the crux of, of sort of like my experience watching these things and watching you engage with these people, is that you know when you say that it is a personal thing, so that means that, you know, in the moments that you choose to use in the show, when you interview certain people uh, in, in these different situations, mm-hmm. that, you know, what I found is that there that even the ones that are prophets or respected leaders, that because you approach them with, with an open mind and an open heart, that their vulnerability as humans becomes almost uh, difficult to take. Yeah, I mean, when I was at the in Hawaii with that doomsday group, and, yeah, and uh, I don't that, mean difficult to take in that I'm against it, but it's just sort of like I can see through this. Yeah, well, and in fact, with with uh, this prophet Jesus with a, a Z that I that the doomsday I, cult the in doomsday, Hawaii, yeah, yeah, in Hawaii, um, the first time I meet him. You know, he's just this like crazy. He's like running around. And I mean, most of that we couldn't never air because it was all about, you know, these like ridiculous, I mean, like crazy, sexually yeah, but, but, explicit but, things. You know, he was like talking about the end of the world and about waking up covered and cum. And it was like all this insane stuff. And the next time I met him, like four days later, I sat him down and I was like, don't do that again. Don't just talk to me like a human being. 
And no matter what you think he, about he, him, well, part of it, I'm sure in his mind is like, oh, you don't want the show. You don't want the show. Yeah. That's yeah. He he like literally. And um, what was amazing about that experience is, again, no matter what you think about him, you might think he's crazy. You might think he is getting messages from the god. I personally don't think that there's a difference between those two things. But of course, there, it's a lot. there may <laughs> yeah. not be a difference between those two things, but there's certainly a difference between a megalomaniacal person who wants to lead a bunch of other vulnerable people in this existence that he's, you know, deemed utopian. Uh, and, you know, like what I felt in watching that is like, this could go bad at any second. It could go bad at any second. And I knew exactly what it was. There's like, you know, kind of like, um, you know, wayward, uh, fragile people that are looking for themselves or looking for something and they heard about this place uh, you know it's not a hostel but you can hang out there maybe you know you can hang out there be part of this group yeah, yeah, you yeah. know it's free the commune. Love. right right yeah. right yeah those all those don't end well generally sustainability and also an answer to the end like an answer the to the end too. right but the whole sort of enviro eco-friendly angle of it yep and the, your comparison to manson was was uh you know i thought good but like you know what what i found in watching that one in particular was like you know you know this guy has got a good game going and it and it's a small game and it's oh it's enough for him and it seems to be enough for the people that are around him but like it, like it's never going to be thousands of people no but tell me you were not at least a little bit intrigued in that second conversation when he was like i don't know maybe i'm crazy i think i feel like i'm right maybe i'm not it's so stressful. Like, I'm barely eating anymore. I don't even have insurance. Like, what if one of my disciples breaks a leg? What am I going to do? Like, just hearing him talk like a person for a minute was, I think, you know, extraordinary. Well, I think that me. what's interesting that you knew, that you said, you know, that wasn't on the show, that, you know, and that how much he uses the word fucking stuff yeah. is that, you know, that's a that's a device. You know, to talk about cum and to talk about fucking and to talk about all that stuff to a bunch of kids who God knows how they grew up. A lot of them from very strict religious exactly. families. Exactly. So you got some guy you yep. know, talking about come and fucking. It's like, what's happening? And it's religion. Right. It's so, mind-blowing. Yeah. So like, yeah, you know. Uh, there was definitely, listen, I met a lot of his followers, and they all pretty much fell into that same category. Lost, hippie-ish, wayward, disaffected with society. Looking for somebody to. Grew up, grew up in a very strict religious if family. If not abusive, I yeah. imagine. And then came to Hawaii uh -huh. and Utopia. And what I'm trying to do is basically train the mind of the viewer in a sneaky way, right? I'm going to entertain you. Yeah, it's exotic. Yeah, it's sensational. Yeah, it's beautiful locations. And yeah, I'm doing crazy shit, you yeah. know? But hopefully what happens is that you watch enough of these episodes and you start to get what's happening here, which is precisely what you say, is that, oh, there's, you know... There are extreme versions and there are moderate versions. And, and underneath all of this stuff is a sentiment that I find really familiar. Yeah, but and also, maybe I have more in common with these people than I thought. Well, that's, well, that's the thing that, that struck me is that like even the ones I watched were the, the Hindu one and then I, I watched the Doomsday one and I watched the Voodoo one mm -hmm. and I watched the Scientology one. I mean, that was one of the most fascinating. What's funny because I just talked to Louis Thoreau about oh, his, really? about his yeah. doc. Yeah. Um, this is, you know, th this is different because this is a, not no, no, about... No, no, no. Your angle was good. Yeah. Because what I wanted to do... I, look, everybody in America has an opinion on Scientology. Right. Okay. But few of us know what Scientology I, actually is. I actually is. have the same opinion you do. You know, and it, it that... that it's, it's no a, weirder than any other religion. That, yeah. and it's a young religion. And, you know, like, I guess the, 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 set, the, the most popular modern American religion to really take was Mormonism. So, right? Absolutely, yeah. So, you, you know, that... Yeah, in in certain ways that there yeah there are tactics and and procedures in within Scientology that seem particularly inhumane and totalitarian and mm -hmm. the nature of Miscavige and hit where he's going with the church and whatever you know I think is is worthy of uh, scrutiny and and and, no question. and brutal criticism but the idea of it not being a religion is ridiculous and by the way that's a perfect example of this divide between religion and faith so the Scientologists that we um, interview and, and hang out with. Yeah. These are devout 
Scientologists. They are devout believers in the religion. They 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 zealously follow the L. ones Ron Hubbard. the ones who have separated from the church in order to honor Hubbard's original plan. Exactly. Right. So they are they call they call themselves reformists. Yeah. They're like the Scientology, like the Protestants of Scientology. Yeah. They feel like the problem with the church is that it's been corrupted and bastardized. You know, after the death of L. Ron Hubbard, they yeah they loathe Miscavige. They agree. They would agree with through. They would agree with Leah Remini. All the stuff that people, you know, anti-Scientologists say about the church, these guys are like, yeah, that's absolutely true. But that's the church, not the faith. Mm -hmm. And, you know, what I wanted to do was, first of all, tell people that that's a thing. Like, I think people are always freaked out. Like, wait, 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 wait. There are Scientologists who follow the religion, but not the church? Well, the thing is, is that most of the time, the way it's captured in in conversations, and I can't, you know, say this across the board, but by ex-Scientologists, people who want out, is that, you know, then they were, you know, subject to being victimized by, you know, fascistic yep. uh, 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 tactics to, to stifle them and, and to shut them by up. By the way, these guys would say the same thing. I mean... The, the, what we always hear about is from the church and from former Scientologists, you know, anti-Scientologists. This is the first time we hear from Scientologists who don't follow the church. And there are half a dozen of these sects. Now, the church would say they're not really Scientologists. They don't really count, you know. What they, do they call them repressor, uh, uh, they call them squirrels. They call them squirrels. The squirrels but yeah. what's the other one? The bad person, the negative the person? SP, suppressive yeah. person. Yeah. yeah. Suppressive person, yeah. Um, yeah. And so, you know, the church is very angry about this show, uh, but they don't really know how to formulate their anger. See, they know the church knows how to respond to Louis. They know how to respond to Leah Remini and right? the people who want out. But they the don't know how to respond to people saying, like, no, we're really doing it. Yeah, they don't know how to respond to a show that's like, no, you actually are a religion. I take you seriously as a religion. It's a real <laughs> thing. But here's the thing about religions is that they break apart. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, so this they, this is a reformation. And they're like, nope, there's no reformation. There's nothing. Oh, we are the only people who can say who is and who is and not every Scientologists. Church, every religion has said that. And my argument is, yeah, that makes you a religion. Yeah. You saying that <laughs> legitimizes you as a religion. So they're like, they're completely baffled. They're like, well, we kind of hate you, but we also you heard appreciate it. Yeah, they're, they're, you know. You've heard from, from people within the church, but well, not yes. on an official level? or from, On an official level. I have been inundated ever since the, the, and, and, the commercials have come and out. And the general tone is what? It's again the the tone is somewhat confused, you know. At the same time, it's like they recognize that the very fact that this show exists it legitimizes them as a religion, which mm -hmm. is what they've always wanted. Like yeah. you know, we are a religion, we are a real religion. Right. But at the same time, the fact that the focus of the show is not on the church but on these breakaway sects. Yeah. Um, and the Purists. point, yeah, and the point of it is, is that look what's happening. Like this, this happened, you know, 500 years ago in the Catholic Church, right? Yeah. People were like, the church is corrupt, it's inept, and it's it's taken away Jesus's true teachings. We are the true Christians. Mm. That's exactly mm -hmm. what these sci reformist Scientologists say. And the church's argument is <laughs> the Church of Scientology's argument is the exact same argument that the Vatican made, which is, no, 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 <laughs> only we can say who is a Scientologist. By right. definition, if you leave us, yeah. you are not a Scientologist yeah, anymore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Here's the fascinating thing, just from like a you know, purely intellectual way. The difference between the Vatican 500 years ago and the Church of Scientology today is mm -hmm. that the Church of Scientology has trademarked Scientology. Yeah. And so they've copyrighted this material. So, you know, the the Vatican could say, oh, you don't get salvation anymore. But the Vatican couldn't say, like, we'll sue you if you keep reading the Bible. Yeah. If, right. <laughs> you know? Right. If Where, only they knew. Right. Whereas the Church of Scientology well, they, is basically like, we will sue you if you keep saying well, that, you're well, a Scientologist. Well, that, that is something funny about what we talked about before is the nature of business. Is that mm -hmm. the, 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 the ritualistic, you know, depth of the Catholic Church knew that they had most people terrified. <laughs> right. Right. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. yeah. They're in charge of salvation. Yeah. You know. You know and, like, and they, they, most people bought it. Yeah. But now it's sort of like... Now it's financial ruin. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Now now we'll take you to court. Exactly. Uh, well, that, it's a business-driven... I don't think the Scientologists have ever, you know, in any logical way, you know, been able to say that the business element of Scientology is, you know, got to be, you know, about 80% of it, even to people that know 
uh, that are in it. Yeah. In fact, I say this all the time. I say like it's it's like the perfect amalgamation of religion and capitalism, right? That's right. Um, salvation, however you define it in the Church of Scientology, cost costs money. Yeah. It just does. And people were like, well, but you give tithes to a church. Right. But your salvation doesn't depend on the th- on the tithe. The other thing that I, I found interesting is just that, you know, by immersing yourself in these things and, and actually documenting, you know, your immediate experience with with the uh, ecstatic message of any of these different things you were involved with by, by being audited and by engaging in that process, by, you know, drinking the, the, the Ganges and by, uh, you know, allowing yourself to, you know, be in the circle with the, with the Jesus with a Z and, and being part of the voodoo ceremony and coming out of it, you know, after you were, you know, in that waterfall, I'm still shaking and whatever that you opened yourself up. But the thing that, that really struck me and I brought it up before was that, all right, you felt the impact of the recruiting tool. Oh yeah, and, and you understood that, like you know, I do, I I am half into an ecstatic state. You know that I I could see that if I do this three more times, you know that who knows, but uh, but that is the difference in like in, in something like New Age spirituality, you know, which draws from any particular religious d- disposition or or uh, ritual. To sort of, you know, create that feeling over and over again without the commitment of a, of a organized church that, you know, there is sort of like, there's something very telling about that. That all those things that you experienced, those feelings may have been real, but in order to really, you know, serve or be served by the religion, the commitment or the faith, mm-hmm. you know, is required. So, you know, to me, it was very interesting about you and about most people who consider them spiritual on any on any spectrum of the of the sort of new age or hippie experience. Uh, it, it is separating ritual from from larger systems of, of belief to feel that relief that you may have felt. And I, I'm not saying that's, that's bad difficult. or good, but it, it is uh, it, it, it it doesn't do the same thing. It doesn't do the same thing because, yeah, in the end, well, this is, look, this is an argument that we, people have in, in the religious studies all the time, you know, which is like, can you have religion without community? I mean, is it all about community? I mean, can you say, um, I'm religious, but I don't ever go to any church. I don't hang out with anybody else who shares my my religion. Mm-hmm. Um you know, I would say yes, because I, I'm much more interested in individual faith than I am in communal religion. But, yeah, this whole idea of belonging and in-group and the rules and the institution and that these are the things that set us apart from everybody else, you know, yeah, whether it's the other church or the other cave. Right. Um, all of those things, I think, are, are deeply a, a, a part of that fundamental experience of what it means to say i'm religious right the tribal thing that goes back to that yeah well it was great talking to you buddy thank you mark i really enjoyed this thanks man take care there you go that was um that was i felt like uh, you know i i felt like i worked out <laughs> on that conversation uh and then i ran into him a couple days later down the street so now that i know what he looks like perhaps we'll be uh Hanging out down at the coffee shop. Don't forget to check out the new comedy, Wilson, starring Woody Harrelson, based on the graphic novel by Daniel Klaus and from the director of The Skeleton Twins. Wilson follows a lonely and hilariously honest middle-aged misanthrope who reunites with his estranged wife, played by the amazing Laura Dern. Wilson gets a shot at happiness when he learns he has a teenage daughter he has never met. That's Wilson, only in theaters, starting Friday, March 24th. I will be at the Fox Theater in Oakland tomorrow night. Friday, uh, March 24th, I'll be um, at the Moor in Seattle on Saturday, uh, March 25th, and at the Vogue in um, Vancouver on Sunday. You can go to WTFPod.com slash tour to, to check upcoming dates. I'll be in Austin, Texas next week, and there's more dates there on the site. Oh, do I have time to play? Yeah, okay. Okay.